Well, the top story this evening, the Supreme Court has upheld the Union Government's 2016 decision to demonetize 500,000 rupee notes. In a major verdict, the five-judge constitutional bench has ruled that the government was well within its powers to issue the notification banning currency notes at short notice. Four judges upheld the decision-making process that led to demonetization, but one judge dissented, terming the decision unlawful and pulled up the government for not consulting parliament and not giving enough time to the Reserve Bank of India to apply its mind. Now, the court's proceedings were broadcast live for the public. Our colleague Ashmit Kumar joins us now with more on what the verdict holds. Ashmit, four is to one judgment coming in. Take us through the details of the majority verdict as well as the dissenting order. Well, the 2016 demonetization exercise affected every person in India without prejudice. And this is the very reason why it was a hugely political issue. It was political when being implemented. It was political when being debated and discussed in public spheres and newsrooms. And certainly political when challenged before the top court. Which is why when the Supreme Court upheld the 2016 note ban, it handed the centre a huge political victory. Here are the details. The November 8, 2016 announcement and the subsequent chaos was challenged in the top court in 58 petitions. The case was referred to a constitution bench of the top court. Here, a 4 is to 1 majority, the apex court has held that all is well with demonetization. The majority judgment authored by Justice B. R. Gawai held that the centre has the power to demonetize any series of notes. Importantly, the court held that it is irrelevant if the stated objectives of the note ban were in fact met. The Supreme Court concluded that the question rather was whether or not due process was followed and to that end, the Supreme Court has held that the notification directing demonetization was in fact not flawed. Supreme Court's majority view is that it was proportional to the objectives that were laid out. The Supreme Court also held that there was a consultation between the centre and the RBI in the six months preceding the note ban. And finally, the court held that there was nothing unreasonable in the 52-day period provided to people for exchanging old currency notes for new ones. And with this, the Supreme Court has laid its stamp of approval on the demonetization exercise. Let's on that note listen in to Justice B.R. Gawai listing out the majority view. The impunity notification dated 8 November 2016 satisfies the taste of proportionality and as such cannot be struck down on the said ground. The period provided for exchange of notes by the impunity notification dated 8 November 2016 cannot be said to be unreasonable. The RBI does not possess independent power under subsection 2 of section 4 of the 2017 Act in isolation of the provisions of section 3 and 4.1 thereof to accept the demonetized notes beyond the period specified in notification. But Justice B. V. Nagaratna, a part of the five-judge bench, did not agree with that view and gave a dissenting view. She criticized and questioned the note ban decision, citing multiple reasons. To begin with, first, she noted in her judgment that uh, Center's note ban proposal had to be backed by a law or, at the very least, an ordinance. She cautioned that without the parliament, democracy will not survive. Second, she frowned on how the RBI did not apply its mind to the issue since it wasn't allowed any time to do so by the centre. She noted how the decision was taken within 24 hours, not giving the central bank enough time to review or assess the impact. Speaking of the impact, she noted that the serious socio-economic implications of the note ban should have been considered by the central bank. And finally, she declared that while demonetization may have been well-intentioned and blessed with noble objectives, it did fall short on various legal grounds. And with that, she's declared the note ban to be an unlawful exercise. But while Justice B.V. Nagaratna's judgment may make for an interesting read, the bigger takeaway will be the overwhelming view of the majority of judges that has held that all is well and all is kosher with demonetization. On that note, let's listen in to Justice B.V. Nagaratna. The measure is reflective of concern for the economic health and security of the country and demonstrates foresight. At mo no point of time has any suggestion been made that the measure was motivated by, by anything but the best intentions and noble objects for the betterment of the nation. The measure has been regarded as unlawful only on a purely legalistic analysis of the relevant provisions of the Act and not on the objects of demonetization. Well, the five-judge constitutional bench delivering its verdict four is to one in favor of the decision-making process that was pursued by the government, the story of demonetization and the legal 
issues facing it ends here. Now, reacting to the judgment, former Finance Minister Peter Zambram said the country is obliged to accept the court's decision, but he went on to say, and I quote, however, it is necessary to point out that the majority has not upheld the wisdom of the decision, nor has the majority concluded that the stated objectives were achieved. In fact, the majority has steered clear of the question whether the objectives were achieved at all, end of quote. Meanwhile, BGP leader and former law minister Ravi Shankar Prasad has hailed the court's verdict and accused Congress leader Rahul Gandhi of creating, and I quote, chaos. भाई राहुल गांधी बार बार ये हल्ला करते थे तो कभी आप समझने की कोशिश करते हैं क्या क्योंकि राहुल गांधी जी के बारे में मैं एक बात कहूंगा वो समझते हैं तभी जब कोर्ट का फैसला होता है उसके पहले वो नहीं समझते और मैं आपको एग्जांपल देता हूं राफेल पर क्या क्या नहीं कहा उन्होंने उन्नीस का पूरा चुनाव जिस तरीके से उन्होंने हमारे प्रधानमंत्री के बारे में अपशब्द शर्मनाक कहे उसको हम रिपीट नहीं कर सकते हैं देश जनता ने जवाब दिया जब सुप्रीम कोर्ट का फैसला आया तो ठंडे हो गए ऑनरेबल सुप्रीम कोर्ट हैज प्रनाउंस्ड अ वर्डिक्ट ऑन द प्रोसेस ऑफ डिमोनिटाइजेशन इन द वर्डिक्ट द ऑनरेबल सुप्रीम कोर्ट प्रनाउंस दैट सेक्शन ट्वेंटी टू ऑफ द आरबीआई एक्ट ऑफ नाइनटीन was it correctly applied on this decision or not the majority supreme court verdict deals with the limited objective limited issue of the process of demonetization not with its outcomes we well, from demonetization to the first day of the market trading in 2023 and the last street rung in the new year on a positive note the nifty and the sensex gained over half a percent but mid cap outperformance helped keep the market breath in favor of advances metal stocks leading from the front today and nigel is standing by to wrap up the day's trading action global markets shut nigel uh, but our market starting off 2023 on a positive note Well, it was a good start to 2023 with the Nifty ending on a winning note. Though volumes were still a little bit lower, so it wasn't really houseful. The mid cap and the small cap indices they started off a little bit better, and the hope is that 2023 will be a far better year for the broader markets in comparison to what the headline index is likely to do. The Nifty Bank, well, it managed to conquer the 20 DMA, which was a bit of a resistance zone, but just about. Now, if we're looking at the indices itself, just take a look at that. The mid cap and the small cap indices, both of them did outperform, which is heartening. But there were two sectors that were in focus today: metal stocks. On optimism of China reopening, you had Hindalco as well as uh, Tata Steel. Both of them were the biggest gainers on the Nifty itself. Jeffrey said, "Come, go ahead and upgrade the stocks." Well, the smaller names as well did do pretty well. Moil, there was a price increase out there, and Sale. There's optimism that the entire Ferris pack will see improvement of profitability. That's the hope as of now. But metals did well. Auto stocks on the flip side, they had a, a mixed uh, reaction to their numbers. Mahindra and Mahindra managed to end mildly higher. Bajaj Auto a little bit cautious on the export, so that was a little bit lower. But the big winners were from the broader markets. SML Isuzu, uh, the reopening trade is playing out there. Schools, colleges back, uh, uh, you know. So that's why that stock was up 20 percent. While Atul Auto as well did end higher. There are other big winners. MCX was under pressure in trade today. Uh, you know they've renewed their contract with 63 boards. The hope was that they'll be resorting to a new system which will cut down costs. That didn't happen, so that was under some pressure. NCC one more order, so that was higher. And from the IT pack itself, persistent systems was the big outperformer. The Nifty not out of the woods yet again because it needs to conquer that 18,250 to around 18,350. Nonetheless, it was a good start to the year. A good start indeed, Nigel. Many thanks. The rupee, meanwhile, kicked off the new year on a strong note as well, but retreated from early strength, ending at 82.73 against the greenback. This is banks bought dollars on behalf of importers. China's factory activity has contracted for the third straight month in December. This has also been the sharpest pace of contraction in nearly three years. The rise in COVID cases has led to large-scale disruption. The Purchasing Managers Index fell from a reading of 48 in November to 47 in December. Anything below 50. is contraction and speaking of china the head of the international monetary fund has warned that china is likely to grow at or below global growth for the first time in 40 years in a conversation with cbs kristalina georgieva said three big economies which are the us the eu and china are slowing down simultaneously and the imf expects one third of the global economy to be in recession this year Now even as the world economy is bracing for a recession manufacturing activity in India is at its highest level in more than 2 years from a reading of under 56 in November the purchasing managers index is now closer to 58 marking the highest increase in new factory orders and production in more than 2 years and speaking of production the auto industry reported a mixed set of sales numbers 
This December, while commercial vehicle sales registered a strong rise, India's leading car maker Maruti Suzuki and two-wheeler giant Bajaj Auto ended 2022 on a weak note. Sonia standing by with the details. Sonia. Well, thanks a lot for that. I decided to, you know, break it up into the uh, strong and the weak numbers. And just to start off with the strong numbers first, Tata Motors was a very good set of numbers. Both the passenger vehicle as well as the commercial vehicle segment did quite well. In fact, the total domestic sales went up 10%, led largely by the medium and heavy commercial vehicle segment, which saw a growth of 34%. And Tata Motors posted its highest ever monthly as well as quarterly passenger vehicle sales. Let's move on to Ashok Leyland. In fact, the entire commercial vehicle piece has done really well. So Ashok Leyland, very strong sales in December, a total growth of 45% year-on-year. This was largely led by the medium and heavy commercial vehicle sales, which were up 61%. And that's because of a revival in bus demand. So bus sales have gone up by about 108% compared to same time last year. Let's move on to m, &M now, where there was very strong traction, both in the auto as well as the tractor segment for them. Auto sales went up 45% year-on-year, led largely by the new launches in the SUV segment. So SUV sales went up 62% year-on-year coming in at over 28,300 units, while the tractor segment, both m and as well as Escorts, did very well. So, um, the tractor sales for m and went up 27% year-on-year. The company is saying that the rubby crop sowing has progressed very well, while Escorts as well, total sales went up by almost about 19-odd percent. Now, on the weaker side, you had Maruti, Bajaj Auto and Royal Enfield numbers, which were quite weak. Maruti's numbers, despite the management saying that, you know, um, the retail sales are better, the wholesale numbers looked very weak total sales down 9% and domestic sales down about 10%. Bajaj Auto as well, big crack in the export numbers which led to an overall fall of 22% and export sales were down by almost about 40%. And finally, Aisha Motors, Royal Enfield sales were below street expectations and down 7% compared to what we saw last year. Back Sonia, many thanks. And speaking of macroeconomic data, the Centre for Monitoring the Indian Economy reports that India's unemployment rate rose to 8.3% in December, hitting a 16-month high. Urban employment rose to above 10% versus nearly 9% in November. However, rural employment saw a marginal slip to 7.4% versus 7.5% in November. The Ministry of Corporate Affairs has waved the green flag for Shipping Corporation of India to split its core in non-core businesses. This paves the way for the government to divest a 63% stake in the company. The government today released a consultation paper for its upcoming online gaming policy. It has proposed self-regulation, mandatory players verification and additional due diligence. Online gaming companies will be covered under the new IT rules that were issued in 2021 for social media platforms. Stakeholders can give their comments till the 17th of January. Uh, we, what we have done is really to create a framework that allows online gaming to expand. We think this is a very, very significant opportunity for the digital economy. We think there are hundreds and thousands of startups that are waiting to come into the online gaming space and have been held back uh, because of all the noise and ambiguity created by the various court orders. We have, in a sense, made it, kept it very simple. What we have said is, Every young startup, every startup, every innovator who wants to get into the online gaming business has a very steady, uh, precise uh, roadmap that he or she can follow. Uh, the rules uh, that we've seen uh, at first glance uh, clearly indicate that, you know, the industry is more or less complying with, with the requirements and whatever needs to be done from here on uh, as the self-regulatory organization, the SRO, that, uh, that uh, you know, the Métis has mentioned in the rules. Uh, likewise, you know, we'll align with the uh, stakeholders that we already have and also those who are not part of the, uh, of the AIGF. Whatever we have seen uh, in the rules right now, so it, uh, you know, does not get into the ambit of uh, skill and chance. Well, proposed rules there for online gaming. With less than a month for the union budget, the economic wing of the RSS says Chinese imports are hurting India's manufacturing sector, resulting in capacity underutilization. The Swadeshi Jagran Manch has called for an across-the-board increase in tariffs on Chinese goods. We can't allow our industry to be killed. Uh, as I uh, want to underline here, there are about seven uh, units, seven plants working for Viscos and uh, only one of them is actually working. So there is a huge underutilization of capacity. So uh, this is only because they are, the Chinese are dumping their uh, goods. They are, uh, they are sending here uh, using under invoicing and several other unethical and illegal means also. We 
just can't increase the tariffs on China alone. That would not be in keeping with our commitments at the WTO, uh, uh, whereby we have given most favored nation treatment to China. If we feel that there is underpricing, that is dumping is taking place or subsidies are being given in uh, uh, contrary to the WTO commitments of China, then we can take action against China. Well, that is the budget recommendation from the Swadeshi Jagran Manch. Tata Group veteran and former Tata Sons director R. Krishna Kumar died at the age of 84 after suffering a cardiac arrest. Krishna Kumar joined the Tata Administrative Service in 1963 and held several important positions in the conglomerate in his long career. He was honored with Padma Shri, the fourth highest civilian honor for his contribution to Indian trade and industry in 2009. Tata Sons Chairman Emeritus Ratan Tata said words cannot describe the deep sense of loss he feels on the passing of his friend and colleague. Tata Sons Chairman N. Chandrasekharan said what stood out in Krishna Kumar was his deep sense of compassion as a human being. Well, time for us to head to a break, but up next, uncertainty over the relaunch of Jet Airways continues. Head of the Monitoring Committee asked Sanjeev Kapoor to refrain from calling himself the CEO. That and more when we get back. Well, here's the latest in the ICICI Bank video con case. The special CBI court adjourned the hearing of Venukopal Dhut's application challenging his arrest. No further date has been decided for the next hearing. Meanwhile, the Bombay High Court is set to hear Chanda Kochar and Deepak Kochar's application seeking quashing of their remand orders. The centre has extended the fixed price cap of liquid oxygen, oxygen concentrators and five medical devices including nebulizers and oximeters. The step ensures that prices don't shoot up in case of a surge in COVID cases. The extension will remain effective till the 31st of March. Here's the latest in the snack making space. Popular budhia maker Bikaji Foods International has acquired Hanuman Agro Foods, further expanding its business. After the acquisition, Bikaner will hold 99.6% stake in Hanuman Agro Food. On to a CNBC TV 18 exclusive, Jet Airways' revival plan has taken another interesting turn, even as uncertainty continues over its relaunch. We learn from sources that Jet Airways' erstwhile resolution professional and the head of the monitoring committee, Ashish Chaucharya, has sent a notice to Sanjeev Kapoor objecting to his designation as the CEO of Jet Airways. Joining us now, Madiha takes us through the details. Madiha, things getting more and more challenging for Jet Airways and its possible revival. Well, things are getting more challenging for the Jalan Calrock Consortium. The relaunch process is being hit by one headwind after other. The latest one is the notice that you mentioned by the erstwhile resolution professional and the head of the Jet Airways Monitoring Committee to Sanjeev Kapoor. Remember the Jalan Calrock Consortium that won the bid to revive Jet Airways had approved uh, Sanjeev Kapoor as the CEO designate of Jet Airways in April last year. Through this notice, the monitoring committee is making it clear that it is still supervising the implementation of the resolution plan. It also makes it clear that the airline has not taken over, has been not taken over by the consortium yet. And hence, Sanjeev Kapoor must refrain from using the designation of CEO of Jet Airways. The notice says that Sanjeev Kapoor's tenure as CEO will commence only after the resolution plan achieves the effective date and the monitoring committee approves his appointment as the CEO of the airline. The notice very clearly states that using this designation in the current status could be misleading and can confuse the stakeholders. The notice further says that Sanjeev Kapoor uh, making state, asks Sanjeev Kapoor from refraining from making statements on behalf of the airline, saying that it could be construed as misrepresentation. While one can question why has the monitoring committee taken so long to raise an objection, the timing of this notice coincides with recent comments and articles by Sanjeev Kapoor on aviation related matters where uh, he spoke in the capacity of the CEO of Jet Airways. The consortium in response to our query confirmed that Sanjeev Kapoor was appointed by the JKC as the designated CEO of the to be revived Jet Airways in April 2022 and he remains the CEO designate until ownership of the airline is transferred to the JKC. All right, Madhya, appreciate you joining us. Now, top-level exits continue at Zomato. The co-founder and chief technology officer, Gunjan Patidar, has resigned after more than 10 years in the company. According to Zomato's regulatory filings, Patidar was one of the first few employees of the company and built the core tech systems. This is another big exit after co-founder Mohit Gupta quit after a four-and-a-half-year stint in November last year. Well, speaking of food aggregators, over 1.65 lakh biryanis, over 16,000 plates of chole bhature and over 61,000 Domino's pizzas. That's what India ordered on Swiggy 
on New Year's Eve. Meanwhile, Zomato has seen a 45% surge in order volumes versus 2021. And Blinkit got a single order worth over 28,000 rupees in Bangalore. Shilpa joins us now to take us through India's favorite food, most interesting orders and what excited customers on New Year's Eve. Shilpa. Well, a large number of you may have been out partying on New Year's Eve, but if data from Swiggy and Zomato is anything to go by, an equally large number of people brought in 2023 at home. Now, expecting a huge rush through the night, orders started pouring in as early as uh, 6.30 or even earlier, with Swiggy registering 1.3 million orders by 6.30 p.m. itself. Now, the platform saw most orders coming in from Bangalore, Hyderabad, followed by Mumbai, and then followed by Delhi and Chennai. Now, what did they order? Well, it's always biryani at the top of every food list. Now, even before 7.20 p.m., more than 1.6 lakh orders were placed for biryanis. And along with that, over 61,000 orders for Domino's pizzas, Chole Bhature and Kichidi also, with a lot of people seeking home food uh, or the comfort of home food, more than 12,000 orders for Kichidi's were placed as well. Now, Zomato wasn't far behind. Its order volumes were up 45%, and four of which CEO Dipinder Goyal himself ordered. And at Zomato too, biryani was among the most ordered food items. But more than food, grocery orders were in high demand. Now look at these starts from Swiggy's Instamart. 1.76 lakh chips were ordered, uh, more than 14,000 sodas, more than 14,000 lemons and uh, nearly 15,000 sodas and all these even before 9 p.m. And some interesting standouts were 3,000 orders for stationery. And as the night progressed, orders for condoms too peaked. Now, it was a party at Blinkit as well. Over 56,000 uh, packets of chips, 1.5 lakh lemons and other party essentials were ordered. And its biggest order was worth nearly 29,000 rupees from Bengaluru, a customer there. Now, in fact, Goyal also tweeted that Zomato delivered more orders just this New Year's Eve than it did in all the first three years of launching its food delivery service. Well, a happy New Year indeed for these platforms. Well, Shilpa, many thanks for joining us. Now, India's art scene could soon get a shot at expanding its presence in the international art world. I am Ahmedabad and Mumbai-based Aura Art Development have come together to create India's first Constant Quality Price Index, which will help track art prices in the country. Aditi Sharma reports this could be the catalyst Indian art and artists needed to energize art as an investment opportunity. That Germany Roy oil piece hanging on your living room wall is about a lot more than aesthetics. But have you tracked the change in its price since you bought it? How has it fared compared to pieces by other, even newer Indian artists whose works have been making them household names among art connoisseurs? You can now find out by accessing the Indian Art Index, the brainchild of Mumbai-based art gallery Aura Art and IIM Ahmedabad. This first-of-its-kind index tracks the movement in the prices of pieces by 25 prominent Indian artists, from M.F. Hussain to S.H. Raza to Tayyab Mehta, based on prices that they fetch at 11 global art auctions. Data is updated quarterly and the index is published twice a year. The aim its creators say is not just to offer real-time price information, but promote Indian art globally. The index um, starts in uh, the first quarter of 2001. So far, we have analyzed uh, artworks, uh, artworks auctioned uh, across different auction houses across the world, but mostly in India, of top 25 artists. Uh, it amounts to nearly uh, 10,000 artworks that we have analyzed. Last year, in India alone, pieces by Indian artists, which were collectively worth $100 million, went under the hammer. Now, this is a small number, working out to less than 1% of the global art market, which is dominated by the US and China. But the domestic market is on track to explode as India adds to its billionaire count, many of whom increasingly see art as an investment. You have 1,100 industrialists and uh, wealth uh, creators in India with a 1,000 crore plus wealth in 122 cities. My guess is that only 25 to 50 of them have been allocating anything of meaningful amounts to art. Even if they put 1% of their wealth in the next 10 years towards art, which is 10 crores per person and growing, you have 10,000 crore uh, coming into art from this one small pool. The index also aims to bring in greater transparency in the art investment world. The Indian Art Index will join the likes of Sotheby's Main Moses and Artnet, which provide several art indices. Hopefully, it will also play a significant role in adding Indian art to the global art investors' palette. In Mumbai, Aditi Sharma.
And with that, it is time for us to wrap up this edition of India Business Hour from all of us here. Goodbye. Thanks for watching. Here's wishing all of our viewers a very happy 2023.